further ado, I'm going to pass it off to our first presenter. Hi, my name is Nika Koda. I recently graduated from my master's program here at Penn, uh, studying integrated product design, also known as IPD. I have two amazing friends that I made in my IPD journey, as well as two phenomenal nursing students working on our project. And our project is named Reblossom. It is a therapy tool, stroke therapy tool, for fine motor movement. Now, you're probably wondering, that, is, that does not look like a stroke therapy tool, and that's true. Reblossom incorporates creativity, fun, and individuality into therapy, and we want to make sure that the therapy itself has movement, reflex, dexterity, uh, range of motion, and a bunch of other therapy tools all incorporated into one. So, why are we working on stroke therapy? Stroke is one of the leading cause of disability and long-term disability in the United States. And, oh, I'm sorry, in the United States. Now, 40, every 40 seconds, someone is having a stroke right now. And that means by the end that I'm talking right now, someone will be able, someone has to use a product like mine in order to recover. So, while I was working on this project, I realized a lot of research and developed a understanding of the field, as well as something that I also went through as a caregiver. There are multiple barriers when it comes to stroke therapy. And one of those barriers is shame barrier, the motivation barrier, as well as the affordability barrier that is incredibly huge and a wall for a lot of patients to actually get their recovery. So during the user research and user journey research that we've had, we realized that patients are scouring the internet trying to find the best tools ever in order to get better. But Oftentimes, those patients are finding incredibly expensive tools, $400, $2,000. Not everyone can afford that. So they end up going for the more affordable version, which is one-dimensional, and it can't be used really properly. So the patient will end up utilizing a peg and board system, get bored, not unmotivated, no creativity, and they end up stopping their therapy session. So we firmly believe the artistic expression is incredibly important to motivate patients and to be able to use this product. As you can tell, there are two different types. This is the very standard and specific type of peg and board system, which works with range and strength. For us, we cause, we, we add a lot of other elements to it. Um, so, what is Reblossom and what is our problem? And what is our, what is our uh, product? Uh, Reblossom is an Ikebana flower. Every, Reblossom is a flower arrangement tool style that incorporates the peg and board system. And we incorporate this through modularity. If you can tell, there are different types of flowers that we have that you can see. And it has bendability and weight differences and balances. Think of this flower as a dumbbell for your fingers to be able to rehab. And then you're creating a flower arrangement and you're actually showing off, hey, I can do this and it's beautiful. This is our uh, patient user testing and um, he had a really fun time. As you can tell, again, I'm kind of hammering this in. We are very different from the market. We're adding artistic value, creativity, and motivation to patients wanting to use our product. Our product is also set around $100 and $140 comparative to the prices that you see now, which is $400, $2,800, and then $14. But that's a children's toy that a lot of patients end up using. So our market is specifically currently just for stroke patients. However, we do believe that we can expand to different types of mobility, um, uh, mobility affected patients, such as RA dementia and accident related issues. There are a lot of different fine mobility tools out there that can benefit from what we're giving out. Our revenue sources is also in just asset sales. So specifically, we are thinking of substitution models for giving out different types of flowers over the course of three months or two months, depending. So we tested our product in the end, and he actually said, thank you for giving me the opportunity to make a flower arrangement for my wife. Our company goal is to give back dignity and independence to patients by through creativity. 
Let's heal together through creativity. And our ask is if anyone knows everyone if anyone knows anything about neurological or a neurologist who is willing to work with us for our RB process, it will be wonderful. Thank you so much. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, first of all, uh, congratulations on the work that you've accomplished so far. And it is nice to see the proliferation of um, devices and things pivoted towards um, elderly populations or people with, that are differently abled. So I commend you for that. Um, my question had been, and it's kind of related to your neurology ask, um, how much work has been done to understand where your technology is in terms of meeting the standard of care that the pet board is meeting? And would it be comparative to um, what they think that the pet board accomplishes for the patients? And do you have a feel of what that, like, what that, the process of getting that understanding entails? Uh, can I get that? Oh, hi. So I'm actually, I've been caretaking for the last 15 years of my life on and off with my father and my uncle. And being in that space, I actually worked with my parents to do therapy. And through that time, I also worked with a lot of other patients because somehow that ended up happening because my dad was doing better than a lot of other patients. Um, and in that term, we found out that everyday therapy is incredibly important. And it, in our specific product, we are giving more than what a peg and board system does. So in, instead of a very flat board, we have different elevations, and uh, the pegs itself is also different balances, which then adds strength development, uh, reach development, dexterity development, and range of motion, which is not specifically what a peg and board does, but it incorporates multiple different types of stroke tools that are expensive into one. Um, and because it's modular, it can actually work with different types of patients as well. So that means that it caters towards the patient rather than the patient working with just one tool, if that makes sense. And for us, we realize that that is incredibly important because you're working in different, you're working unison in all these types of therapy, cognitive, physical therapy, all at once, which means that you're not working just on the peg and board, you're working on everything else that activates that type of therapy. So we believe, if we can get an RIV, that the fact that we are a lot more engaging than just a traditional art, uh, peg and board, but also be able to say, hey, we incorporate a lot of multiple functions in our product, and it's cheaper. The home care system right now is really expensive, and people can't afford all these tools in order to do therapy. So they only do one or two, and then they stop, and then they end up becoming long-term disability patients. So we want to stop that cycle by saying, hey, we have a product here that can utilize a lot of the fine motor movement tools and skills and get better, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Oh, sorry. okay, so just a follow-up question. What is the regulatory process for this device? Yeah. And have you kind of started going down that path? So it is a class one device. Um, if I were to go to the you know, regulatory system. However, we can just sell this product as well as a, just a therapy tool. A lot of the peg and board systems are not really going through regulatory systems. However, we do believe that if we go for an IRB process, we would like to be able to prove and say, hey, there's actual functionality in our product where it's motivational, it's, you know, we can actually adhere patients to work on their therapy instead of having that fall off. And if we can do that, we believe that we can go through the insurance system and the insurance route as well. So it really depends on which route we go to, where we just go to market and say, hey, home care, take care caregivers, would you like to try our product versus, oh, hey, do you, you want to get through an occupational therapist? Great. Thank you. Again, uh, this is a, a great uh, problem that you're seeking to address. And so thanks for working on that. One of my questions is, can the tool be used without managed care, um, such that folks aren't injured or they're doing the wrong types of movements at the wrong time, or how does it work? So we realized with our research that a lot of patients are using YouTube videos, and so we're applying to have YouTube videos as well as instructions to use our product. Our product isn't very dangerous at all, 
to be exact. So yeah, it shouldn't be too harmful in that sense. Um, but we do have like instructional videos that we were bringing in occupational therapists to work and work with our product and also create certain sessions. And that's like something that we would like to explore on Q4. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. Yep. And it brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Thank, Thank you. you. This is Sophia Kenna, the younger sister of our COO, Gabriella Kenna. Sophia was born two months prematurely, resulting in a week's long stay in the Princeton Hospital's NICU. Now, during this stay, she experienced harmful auditory frequencies, equivalent to a fire alarm for over 12 hours every day. Her parents had a hard time coming in because they had work obligations and they had other children to tend to. Now, this problem is not unique to Sophia. As NICU graduates face a host of lifelong developmental issues, most notably 10% exit with some sort of hearing impairment due to this harmful auditory environment. A wearable medical device, the Sonarabini, attenuates this frequency by 98%, while also allowing vocal contact to pass directly to the infant. Our technology interfaces with a mobile application that allows parents to communicate to their infant while they can't be physically by their side. We prioritize ease of workflow and clinical integration into our beanie by incorporating the electronic components directly within hospital grade beanies. Now this is an entirely novel solution and thus we have filed for a non-provisional utility patent. Additionally, we are partnered with Cardinal Health to assist us through the FDA regulatory approval process. Our market is created using existing reimbursement codes, totaling $1.5 billion. Notably, the neonatal critical care market is experiencing rapid growth, as preterm birth rates have reached their all-time high since 2007. Thus, neonatologists have experienced an openness in trying new technology as they understand the urgency of this problem. Numerous solutions have been created to address this issue. However, these solutions have significant shortcomings, and as it has been proven that they cause both linguistic and cognitive deficits in, these, in this patient population. Our technology has been validated by over 40 customer discovery interviews with both parents and physicians aided through the program of i -Corps. Parents have emphasized the emotional connection that they want with their child when they can't physically be there, while physicians recognize the urgency of helping and improving the developmental outcomes of this vulnerable population. To generate a revenue, we will sell directly to parents through various approaches across the NICU journey. Now, when a neonate enters the NICU, Physicians will recommend the Sonorabini to provide immediate protection. As the social care team is forming, they will suggest supportive, supportive assistance and suggest the Sonorabini to help clinical outcomes. Now, in tandem with this, a social care, or sorry, a parent foundations will be connecting parents with support groups, and they'll be suggesting ways in which you can connect to your child. Lastly, during daily rounds, Nurses will suggest this Nurabini as it will help in developmental outcomes for this population. We are a team of University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania bioengineering graduate students with experience in management consulting, venture capital, and clinical research. And we are a team committed full time to this venture for the foreseeable future. Our seed round of $400,000 will allow us to navigate the regulatory approval pathway, but also enable us to have a collaborative in-person environment so that we develop the best device possible. Join us in enabling every NICU patient to pursue a brighter future. I thank you and welcome any questions that you may have. There were a lot of, let me start the way that I started the last one. 
Thank you. I also think this is a very important um, population that's being considered. Um, my question is around the assumptions made about adoption. So you said like the nurses were passing out in this section. What are you doing to work? How are you coming up with those assumptions that that's how your D to C model will work? Yeah, awesome. Thank you. I'm going to pass this question to Gabby. Yeah, absolutely. So we decided to pursue those sorts of sales channels as through our interviews with multiple NICU parents. They mentioned to us that they were bringing in devices to the hospital, such as the outlet that tracks heart rate and oxygen that really soothe um, their nerves about going home. And so they mentioned to us that nurses were evangelists for the outlet, as well as social workers, and also like different sorts of resource pamphlets that they found from parent foundations. And so um, we really began going to the source of our customer to ask where are they getting their information from. And so um, as we use that revenue stream to prove to hospitals that there is a need, that is our eventual goal is to become the standard of care. Um, so we're leveraging our access to parents in that way. Um, great presentation, I agree. So, quick question just regarding the business model. Um, where are you in the development of it, and have you kind of thought about how much you'll charge patients for it, and how much the cost to make it will be? Yeah, for sure. So, answer, to the, answer the initial part of the question, currently we're basically in an agreement with Cardinal Health, and they've basically given us a pathway with predicate devices proving equivalency um, for our 510K approval. Um, so that's where we are in terms of just regulatory. In terms of our COGS, it is only around $11 to make. It's very cheap. And in terms of pricing, um, I'll let Gabby answer this question. Absolutely. And so as we are selling to parents, we've looked at other audio therapy devices that are sold in the NICU, such as speakers, um, and those go for about $250 to $300. And then as we look to become the standard of care, once we have um, shown and proven our clinical outcomes, the reimbursement coverage for the product associated is $3,175. Um, in terms of development, we have an initial prototype completed and we're currently working on talking to manufacturers about making a commercial and scalable version of it. Yeah, I just clicked to the slide because it's a breakdown of price using CPT codes um, per day, kind of the research we did and how we got to our market size and our reimbursable price. Um, is there a thought about adding, so I know this is more of an auditory device, but is there a thought of adding, of, is Cardinal Health supplying the clinical um, expertise that you need on the team just to support the clinical outcomes you're proposing to have in the future? Are they, how are they helping you in terms of the strategy around the clinical support? Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, I noticed that no one is a clinician on your team. Oh, oh. <laughs> is, is Cardinal Health, um, you know, backing it up, giving you strategic partners that are more clinical based or how are you supplementing that um, gap in your team? Yeah, so I can answer first and then you guys can add on. But um, through numerous different accelerator programs, we've gained a variety of mentors and uh, physician mentors that help us guide us specifically, you know, listening to their problems and adapting our device to it so that we're not, you know, creating a solution with no problem. And um, so that's where our main mentorship is coming from. I don't know if you guys want to add to that as well. Additionally, uh, we've developed relationships with standard Stanford Children's Health and SHOP, and they have each given us written commitment to help us with the testing and integration of the Sonorabini into their NICUs. If there are no other questions. Okay, so we'll say thank you, and that was a great presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. It's so great to see so many of your faces. My name is Dr. Nikhil Illa. You can usually find me in dirty blue scrubs right down the street working in the ER at Health. But today, I'm very excited to talk to you about PocketScribe, our direct-to-consumer um, dictation app that's built for providers across all specialties. I want you to take a minute to step into the shoes of an ER doc. You're going room to room. You're treating patients having strokes, heart attacks, bleeding patients, 
pregnant women delivering babies. And imagine that one of the worst parts of your job is actually finishing up your patient notes at the end of your shift. That's my reality, and the reality of many of my colleagues, too. We spend a ton of time on our notes, and frequently have to stay several hours late after a shift finishing up our notes. The amount of time we spend dictating and writing our notes definitely leads to increased ER wait times, and is the leading cause of burnout amongst physicians. Our solution is to revolutionize the way physicians write their notes. Right now, I have to go through multiple checklists, complicated checklists, many boxes. It takes me about 10 minutes to get through a note. With Pocket Scribe, I'm able to dictate my note naturally, like I'd be having a conversation. And AI transcribes and organizes the note into the relevant sections. It's also portable. Right now, I have to sit at a workstation in my patient's room or at my desk and type out the entire note. With Pocket Scribe, I can dictate my note where I want and when I want. I can also give it commands. I can tell it to fill in a normal physical exam or fill in a normal review of systems, and it's able to go in and do that part of the note for me. Our plan is also to go direct to consumer so that we are able to empower providers to get the tools they need for their jobs and not have to rely on health systems. Better workflow means faster note completion, but it also means that I can see more patients in a shift, meaning more, more money in my pocket and more money in the, provider, in the hospital system's pockets. But more importantly, easier notes means happier doctors, and lower wait times means happier patients. Right now is the perfect time for PocketScribe to come to market. Maturation of AI in the last few months is what allowed me to build my proof of concept, and will, is what will allow us to build our MVP. There's also been significant changes in the way physicians and hospital systems get paid. It relies now more on your medical decision making as you document on the note, making it even more important for us to be able to put that into our notes. That is something that PocketScribe is tailored to capture. Our go-to-market strategy is to initially target emergency physicians and providers. And at a 10% penetration of that market, we would expect to see about $6 million in annual revenue. However, we, like I mentioned, quickly want to go to other specialties because the innate capabilities of PocketScribe are applicable to all specialties. Our proposed subscription pricing is based on our monthly cost of about $12 per month, leaving us healthy margins and room for, for growth. As an ER doc, I can say that our competition has missed the mark. Their tools are complicated to use, and they don't capture the amount of complexity we need to put in our note. One, so that our physician colleagues can understand what happened in the patient visit, but two, also for reimbursement, which, like I mentioned, with these recent changes, medical decision making is the biggest component of a note. And all of that happens outside the patient room. To date, we've had over a dozen ER docs test our proof of concept, and surveys coming in have been overwhelmingly positive. We are excited to bring our tool to market, but at the same time have thoughtfully mapped out our next 12 months and our growth strategy in that time. One of our biggest focuses is patient privacy and security, and protecting our providers as well. In order to safely get to market, we need the help of a HIPAA or a patient privacy consulting firm. We also need help to grow, and so our hope is that we can expand our team and work on a targeted marketing effort. And so our ask for you today is introductions to pre-seed or angel investors, or simply 30 minutes more of your time so we can tell you more about Pocket Spread. At this time, I'll invite one of our co-founders up, Jennifer Rooney. Uh, she's a PhD student at Harvard studying biostatistics and epidemiology. Um, and our other technical co-founder, Pat, is in Canada. He's a full-stack software developer um, and is a part-time MBA student at the University of Waterloo. Um, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, please visit our table if you have any other questions, and um, thank you. Um, really nice presentation, thank you. I really like this idea as well. I mean, I certainly understand the need. Um, if your business model is to go direct to physician, how will you, how are you thinking about integration in like Epic or whatever your system within the healthcare 
system is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our overall business model and our approach is a B to C to B in order to garner up enough users and enough demand to eventually sell to enterprises. Um, Epic and Cerner, the two biggest EMRs, essentially have a 50 to 60 percent market share. I come from a medical school where we just had a white box that we would type into. And for a user like that, PocketScribe is perfect because you get your entire note laid out to you and then you're simply able to copy paste it into that EMR. Our goal is with um, um, eventually selling to hospital systems, uh, you know, going through that, that difficult process, that 16 to 18 month sales cycle that many of my competitors go through, that at that point we'll have established enough users, but also built up functionality to allow direct to EMR integrations. I was just going to say, this is timely. It, it makes sense, and I agree with Sasha that it's a good idea. Thank you. We might have had a question from the audience. Yeah, right. Sure. No. Sorry. My question is fairly easy. Uh, how are you going to compete with Microsoft since they announced in March that they're doing the clinical tool basically based on AI? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for context for everyone else, uh, Microsoft is also working on an ambient transcription tool. So that would listen to your conversation that you have with the doctor in the room, and then that would be sort of copy pasted into the note for you to work on. Uh, that is only part of the solution. Uh, like I had mentioned, there's massive changes in documentation practices and billing now. And so essentially, while it's helpful to have that conversation, I still would have to leave the room and spend five to seven minutes on the medical decision making piece talking about my differential diagnosis, talking about what medicines I'm gonna use, and talking about my plan for the patient. That is not something I typically do in a room with a patient. I usually have a, um, a much more redacted version of that. Um, and so I, I think that you know, they are building a, a helpful tool, but it's not a complete solution the way PocketScribe is. Sorry, I think just one more thing to add to that is the concern by patient and provider. Um, in having your entire conversation listened to by Microsoft, I think they do have a hard sell um, going to market um, it's Microsoft. They'll be able to do it, but uh, I think that they have an uphill battle as well. I just have one more thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we've definitely thought of this. Yeah, we've thought that a lot. <laughs> um, the platform that they have is really applicable to an outpatient setting. So where you're sitting in a clinic and you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, it's not able to transcribe operative notes. So your surgeon can't use that. And a surgeon needs to have an operative note in order to bill for their procedure. OBGYN can't use it. Um, I can't use it because I go in and out of, doc of patient rooms so many different times. PocketScribe is applicable to all those specialties. And so our market is actually much broader than just um, pre-CP visits or site visits. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you talk to us about um, some of your other competition? Sure, absolutely. I actually have a sign up. Um, there's a, a couple of different startups. So Nuance and Microsoft have partnered together for the DAX tool that we just heard about. Mmodal is what we currently have at Penn, and it's a legacy tool that allows you to do direct voice to text into a box. You still have to be at a workstation for that. It doesn't follow commands, um, and it's um, in general just it's not smart. It's not smart. Some tools that are coming out include Suki, Abridge, and DeepScribe. They're all variations on the ambient transcription tool that we had just heard about. Um, Suki has a direct-to-consumer product. We tried it. It costs twice as much as our product. And it's not that great. It's very hard to use. <laughs> hard to use. Um, Abridge and DeepScribe are two other startups, I think, based out of the West Coast, um, that are still selling direct to hospitals and don't really have um, provider-facing tools at this moment that you could purchase, which is different from our mission in that we want to empower physicians and providers to get the tools they need for their jobs. Okay. Well, thanks. That brings us to the end of our Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks for hey, everybody. I'm, I'm Ted Baumgartner. I'm a, uh, I'm a former Marine officer, so I have a little bit of an issue using the microphone, so please forgive me if it's, uh, you know, I feel awkward speaking with this. but. Uh, I am from a family of South Jersey builders and contractors, now in my third year at the JD MBA program here at Penn, and I am the 
founder of Guthrie AI, a building trades marketplace here to reimagine pre-construction. So construction is an extremely complicated process that uh, needs to be, or the way in which I'll illustrate how it needs to be reimagined or why it needs to be reimagined is through using our, our friends here at Penovation and the Longfellow Project. So, Danita, thank you for being my test subject. So this is a picture of the Longfellow Project, which is a building being planned here at Penovations. The process that Danita and the team have to go through involves hiring engineers and architects to draw plans, sending those plans out to general contractors for bids. Those general contractors sending those plans to subcontractors who each make separate copies with their own markups, with their own documentation, creating a ton of confusion, which makes it all the way to, to the manufacturers who are the ones producing the items weeks and months later. And what's unfortunate about this is most of the subs, including my mother there, put in all of that work and don't even win the contract. That causes an incredible amount of bottlenecks, overheads at the subcontracting firms that the owner ultimately pays for, and then the risk, because with all of that uncertainty and all of those different copies, there's no single source of truth. So that's why we created Guthrie AI, starting first with our project warehouse, using NLP and computer vision to identify and break that scope of work down, allowing us to bring all stakeholders onto one platform. This allows the owners to get twice as many bids as they otherwise would be able to, decreasing their cost of construction. Importantly for me and my family, uh, it lowers our overhead by 50% because we don't have to employ folks on jobs that we're not going to win. And then our supplier and manufacturer partners are able to receive consistent RFPs and quote more projects. The market across the United States, construction is a one, commercial construction is a $1.8 trillion market. The estimating cost to that is about $20 billion with uh, a billion dollar, um, excuse me, a $12 billion cost of the estimating process. And then here in Philadelphia, we've got about a $250 million pre-construction market. And what do the folks in that, what do the folks that make up that total addressable market have to say? Fortunately, my mom's not here, otherwise we would be here for, you know, if you ask her, she'll talk for two hours about how the pre-construction process, you're either too high, uh, you don't win the job, or you're too low, in which case you win the job, but you probably don't want it. And every sub that we talk to has this problem. Of the 168 contractors that we've talked to across the country, almost 90% of them would bid more work if they had qualified estimators. Right now we're starting in Philadelphia because that's where I'm from and this is home. This is where our connection and networks are. But that allows us to build a foothold with the general contractors that have national subcontracting base, that have a national, national subcontracting base. That allows us to standardize our process and create the automated technology that builds our moat and allows full scale, full scalability. So what have we done over the past six weeks? We've done 31 projects for our beta customers, one of which landed generating $75,000 in revenue for that customer that they otherwise would have had because they didn't have enough estimators. We've established our two international offices, one in Venezuela, one in India, uh, as well as way more than we thought that we could accomplish. And I would be remiss if I did not thank and identify the team. Uh, I don't know, is it a faux pas to like ask for a round of applause for the team? But uh, 
Thank you guys. I appreciate everything that you've done for the summer. Uh, and lastly, for my ask, um, is less of what I'm asking for you and more of what I can do for you. I know that we've got the next Penovation parking garage building. We've already got the glazing scope identified, so happy to provide that to you all as you embark on that continued construction journey. Thank you. I'm Ted Baumgartner. This is Jeffrey Ayan. Well, thanks for including me in your presentation. I've never been part of Pitch Day so intimately before. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Probably should and, give you a heads up, but. <laughs> no problem. So um, one of my questions um, is concerning, um, you know, the unique mix of methods and materials. I think a lot of times on construction projects, the secret sauce is in that blend of the contractor's expertise about the method and the materials that they'll use for a particular um, build. And so, while there's AI that can kind of say here are all the required, like minimum requirements, how do you factor in some of the decision making that contractors use that um, tie directly to their own expertise? I mean, that's a that's exactly our competitive advantage because when owners and general contractors are trying to compile the bids from all the different subcontractors, there's no way to compare apples to apples. And the first step that any subcontractor has trying to understand like what is in the actual S, like what does the owner want, and that is what is included in the base bid. All of the nuance and the secret sauce is built on top of what that base is. And so by helping folks get to that starting point more quickly and organizing what that like apples to apples comparison is, you actually facilitate that nuance and the more the, the competition and the expertise because the experts like my mother, aren't wasting time downloading documents, marking up uh, specific things. They can get to the relevant details right away and provide the most competitive price to you without all of the overhead that, you know, unfortunately gets subsidized down the road. So, so it mostly does like, kind of like um, standardized takeoffs or something? Is... I, I don't use the word takeoff anymore because okay, I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, 100%. Okay. And, and it's like dot sign. Right? Like, okay. Yeah. Um, can you walk us through? I don't know if you have any slides to just show us your platform in a little bit better detail. I'm not very familiar with construction, so maybe just to understand like how you're changing it. And I understand this solution to a certain extent, but maybe walk us through kind of the like how a user would interact with your platform. So a user interacts with our platform yeah. the same way that they interact with the current process that they use. And that is how we're breaking through that like user adoption barrier. There's a, I think venture capitalists have like invested $50 billion in construction technology over the past couple of years and like none of them are good because my brothers up there will tell you that like they're not trying to change. And we are not asking the customers to do something new. We're delivering the product that they already use. So when Danita sends out the plans, the subcontractors go through and parse through all of the requirements and then send that in their own Excel, in their own um, format to the suppliers in order to get back a quote from the supplier. So instead of making the subcontractor go through and, and pull out all those kind of monotonous, tedious details, we're just giving that straight to the, to the supplier. Therefore, the sub gets the quote that they already would have gotten, and they know that they're not missing anything uh, that the owner is looking to help. I don't know, I, I kind of like walked through that. I don't have a... So do, do you already have all the suppliers, or do they input that information? Uh, so do you do it by region? So I noticed you're starting in Philadelphia. So is it just based in Philadelphia? These are the suppliers you already have preloaded? Yes. And so okay. like kind of unfair advantage is that like the suppliers, like we are purchasing, again, my brothers are purchasing supplies from them. So they're, and this is how the go to market strategy works with the suppliers because they're looking for business, right? So they're trying to quote jobs and you can make their job easier you know, as we have like they're 
ability to provide you more and more quotes and bid on more jobs drastically increases. So uh, it's a low lift for, it's a no lift for the suppliers and on the subs, they, this is their bottleneck right now. I'm sorry. So here, real close to the end of your Q&A, we have about 20 seconds left. Okay. Who specifically is the paying customer? Is it uh, the, the GC, the subs, the who pay the dollar? The people who pay for it right now, instead of the subcontractors. Instead of paying for estimators in-house, we can shift that and are shifting that cost to the jobs we've actually won in the project management, allowing us to spend less time on jobs that we're not going to win. So it's a subcontractor. Okay. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of the Thank you, guys. Good afternoon, my name is Eliza Berger and I'm the CEO and founder of Locker and here with my team today. So last year I was living in sunny San Diego and I thought this is the perfect time to finally be a cool surfer girl. So I went to rent a board and by the time I brought that eight foot foamy board you carry it on your head five blocks to the beach, my neck's cramping, the whole time I'm thinking, oh, I cannot, I can't even imagine returning this board. I almost never wanted to surf again. And that's when I realized there should be a better way to access the items you need to unlock your passions. And it turns out people are exploring passions all the time. And people explore them in a way that also costs a lot of money. So on a monthly basis, people are spending $200 on activities and hobbies. So it comes with no surprise that when we surveyed 500 people across the Penn and Philly ecosystem, we found that half of them would have preferred renting. But renting, it's not accessible, it's not affordable, and it's not convenient. Which is why there have become these makeshift solutions. This is a real spreadsheet if you wanted to rent a tent that you would go on to for the undergrad Penn Outdoors Club. You would try to find maybe this girl here who maybe can give you the tent, it's very unclear. So maybe you go to Penn itself. Well, Penn's own form says in big bold writings, at least 48 hours and no guarantee of that being a request process. So it's not reliable. So it's not surprising that people go to their own friend groups and communities and ask people, here's Sarah's asking for the tent. People are also asking for a smattering of items, also like tennis rackets, sleeping bags, et cetera. But just because you ask a friend doesn't mean that, well, that item is still available. And for the lender, they don't really know how much you can ask a friend. I mean, it's kind of an awkward question, right? And for both of them, the number one pain point that we found in all of these cases is the when and the where do you actually make the pickup and return? And this is why I still have my friend Jotika's tennis racket nine months later, and they still owe her. <laughs> so we want to make renting affordable, accessible, and convenient. It's accessible because you just go onto our site and you search tent and you find what's there, you find when it's available, where it's available. It's affordable because the pricing is set by peers for peers. And most of all, it's convenient because we took care of that pickup drop-off problem. We have locker hubs, which I'll talk about in a second. So on our site, we started with three categories based off of where demand was, um, as well as where we could form partnerships with clubs to roll this out in our beta version, which is ski and snowboard, camp and hike, sports and play. And then when you go on and you reserve the tent, you would then pick it up or drop it off from a locker hub. A locker hub could be physical lockers, as this is the case in Pawtruck and their gyms, or working with um, a commercial business, a local storefront, that it's helping them drive foot traffic. This is already a business case being developed for luggage storage. And so we're going to work with those types of partners, like an Insomnia Cookies, cleaning service, and you're bringing people to the front. So it's a win-win for everyone. All right. Thank you, Eliza. So from a market perspective, Equipment rental is a multi-billion dollar industry that is growing at over 5% a year. And as a result, it drew multiple proponents its way, including Matthew Eidema, VP of Meta, who believes Locker can disrupt the industry. So what we are trying to do is to capture a segment of the industry, starting initially within Penn through partnership with clubs, and then taking this experience to other universities nationwide and pave the way for a future urban launch. Now, looking more at our company now, we are proud to have launched a live website already, and we have invested in preliminary market research and infrastructure development. 
Now our immediate next step is to launch our beta test next fall in Penn, and this is where Penovation Fund can take us a long way in order to fund our basic inventory ownership, cover our operation and tech costs, and allow us to spend a little bit on marketing. Beyond that, our plan is to pilot and launch, and here we need to raise $195,000 in order to invest in talent acquisition and be able to develop our app, further advance our customer service, and invest again in marketing and some inventory ownership that would enable us to further scale in the future. And behind all that is our wonderful team, which brings interdisciplinary skills from all across the Penn community, and of course our advisors whose experience and guidance has been our biggest asset so far during our journey. So thank you. With Locker, what new passion will you unlock? Please use the QR code to see our live site. And we're gonna bring up our team. Great presentation. Um, so it looks like you want to launch at Penn first, and can you talk a little bit about what, uh, like, what do you want to start with as far as what are you planning to rent there? Obviously, I, don't, I won't have time to kind of look at your site, but just give us an idea of how you're thinking about it and, and why universities first. Yeah, so just to start off, we have established partnerships with various clubs on Penn campus, so like the Penn Outdoors Club, the Penn Ski Club, so we think that's going to be a really great opportunity for us to get the ball rolling, get their inventory up on our site, get have them plug in with their members, and especially when in the fall when a lot of students are moving onto campus, we'd be able to set up on Locus like a lot of other apps do, like Side Chat, you know, offer things like cookies to students, have them get downloaded in our app, have them upload their own items to the site because as they're moving in, they have a lot of items to deal with, and of course also during club fair and also um, you know getting partnerships with potential athletes to be brand ambassadors. So we think that there is a very big community at Penn that we want to capitalize on just to start. And then from there, we're going to be able to scale to other universities and of course an urban launch. Mine is connected to Sasha's. How would you make money off of this? Like, is it a percentage that the app takes? I think that part is unclear. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of making money, our main revenue stream is commissions we make on every single rental that will be performed on our platform. So initially, we will start with a competitive take rate of around 10% in order to attract a big amount of lenders, and progressively, we will increase it with scaling closer to 20%, which is industry standard. But we will not stop there. So as we go forward, we are also looking at other revenue streams, and that would include, one, advertising on the website, two, potentially establishing partnership with like brands who want to increase trial rates for their equipment, and three also, you know, like have lenders pay to boost their products and have better space, capture better spaces on our website, and finally also explore the opportunity to multi-purpose our lockers and maybe offer services such as storage or drop-off and pick-up in addition to our rental services. So how far along are you in the development process? I know you said you wanted to start in the fall. So, and I have not looked at the site, um, but how far along are you in? Just a mock up for those curious for the site. Um, so where we are right now is we have the beta version of the site. We also have started securing initial inventory from the grants that we've already gotten from Penn, as well as getting our friends to also upload their inventory on the site. And we've already found that just through asking in, in group channels. The reality is, is students don't have much of a disposable income. So anytime that they can be an entrepreneur and commoditize their resources, that's massive. It means a lot to them. And so we're getting already initial inventory on the site. We're gonna be launching initially with friends and family within the next two weeks, ask for customer feedback so that we can iterate, make the site as seamless as possible. And then when fall comes around, exactly what Shruti was talking about, that's when we're going to be really doing the rollout with clubs. And we've already gotten endorsements from the four main clubs on campuses that are also currently operating disparately. So like I showed you, the Penn Outdoors Club, that was their spreadsheet. But the Warden Outdoors Club, they have their own spreadsheet. And Penn has their own Google form. So we can consolidate all of that onto one platform. That's an amazing opportunity to really allow people to unlock their passions on the outdoor front.
Hey, welcome back from break. Everyone had a snack? You'll notice one thing was missing. Bubble tea. <laughs> Everyone knows what that is, right? I'm here to represent Orbel, a fully automatic bubble tea machine. In case, for whatever reason, you are uninitiated, uh, bubble tea is an increasingly popular drink consisting of black tea, milk, sugar, ice, and the signature bubbles or boba, which are little tapioca pearls. Delightful. And of course, you've got a famously thick straw so that they can go up there and... All right. It's a hugely grown market, projected to reach two billion in sales uh, by 2027 worldwide. Nationally, it looks even better with a 505% increase in search volume uh, just in one quarter of 2021. So, burgeoning market, and yet, despite all that growth, it's only available in specialty brick and mortar stores currently. The reason for this is the business has to allocate significant counter space, multiple machines, huge investment, and they also have to train their staff on this multi step conveyor belt process to use all this uh, specialized machinery. So, that's where, that's where we come in. Orbel is a commercial, automated boba machine that can be installed anywhere. You'll simply walk up to the machine, put in your specifications on the touch screen, throw your cup in the space below, and watch your drink made for you automatically right before your eyes. According to the competition that exists, we believe we outperform them by combining drinkability and accessibility. So we're hitting all the marks where they are only hitting just a few. Currently, we're in the uh, process of developing the IP. We're working with the uh, Dickin uh, IP clinic to prepare for provisional patent filing in December of this year. Uh, we're a B2B to C company. Uh, providing businesses the opportunity to offer bubble tea in their establishments. So, or we've been working with larger institutions like universities who might have several machines peppered throughout their campuses, as well as smaller institutions like a, a single office building or a place like this. You might, you might see one over there someday. Uh, we have two models, leasing and buying. Uh, from lease income, uh, as well as uh, ingredient resupply, which can be done on an ad hoc or subscription basis. And then, of course, we would take a percentage of every sale in that model. And for the leasing model, we'd be looking at about 57000 uh, per machine annual at a 77% uh, gross margin. As far as the purchasing of the machine, uh, the ways to make money off that, obviously, are the purchase of the machine itself. Again, we provide ingredient resupply, and ad hoc repairs would be taking commission through uh, service technicians and the like. So our go-to-market strategy, we currently have three verbal and in-process agreements for pilot programs. And uh, one of which is right here. Isn't that exciting? Uh, roadmap. We have the uh, proof of concept completed in May. We're looking at the pilot prototype with full machine cakes in outer design uh, to be done by October of this year. And that includes all the food and health and safety requirements. Uh, and then a final product launch with supply chain established by mid-2025. A bit about us, who we are, our team is a uh, team of interdisciplinary uh, computer engineers, mechanical engineers, and Wharton students. Uh, thanks for your time, and uh, any questions? Great presentation, thank you. Um, 
talk us through what, what is your ask? Are you raising money? How much do you need? And Uh, great question. Uh, I actually am a fairly new add to the team. I'm the product person doing a little bit of marketing. Our CEO founder is joining us remotely uh, on our phone. That's, uh, she's from the West Coast. And uh, she might be able to run you through a bit, a bit of that. Hi. Um, is it possible to hear me right now? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so our ask is pretty clear. Uh, we need about 35k in order to um, have our pilot ready prototype uh, being able to operate at those locations that are listed out for it to work throughout the fall semester. So number one, I am a bogus lover. Uh, Who is you, were, you, were, uh, you were displaying the grub hub uh, statistics, and I was like, it's me, it's, it's, it's I, I'm the one that's driving up the low with searches, um, just me. Um, yeah. So my follow-up question to that with the 35K is, so this award is only 7K if you win the grand prize, well, will the, what, are you, what, are, are your, uh, what is your fundraising strategy towards? For the rest of the, since you have the verbal agreements, how are you going to bring up the rest of the uh, money to reach that goal? Yeah, so we are pursuing a combination of grant funding um, and also some uh, seeking out some angel investors at the moment. Uh, we currently have about uh, 20k of grant funding secured to work through the fall semester. So obviously the additional 7K would get us really close to reaching that goal. Um, and we will continue to apply to such programs uh, throughout the fall. If you go back to our trajectory, then you can see that in November, past November, or this upcoming November, we're trying to launch an equity crowdfunding campaign, uh, which we think is a good fit for our organization because it would allow us to get funds directly from multi consumers. Uh, and we hope to raise probably in the hundreds of thousands through this campaign uh, to get us to production. There you have it. All right, thank you so much for your time. Hi everyone, I am Christy Carabello, founder of Vertige, a mobile tracking app bringing balance back to vertigo sufferers. By show of hands, how many people here have ever experienced vertigo? Oh, a good amount, okay. So for those who haven't, Imagine one day you open your eyes and the world is spinning around you. You can't see straight, sit up, let alone walk. Every time you move your head, you feel nauseous and disoriented, and you're just scared and riddled with anxiety. This was me. I was actually diagnosed with a vestibular disorder in 2017 that caused me debilitating vertigo. At my worst, I was having 8 to 10 episodes a month where I couldn't get out of bed and I was really, really sick. And I am not alone. 35% of Americans, 69 million people, will experience some form of vestibular dysfunction in their lifetime, with 15 million having chronic symptoms, and the majority of these people who are tracking are doing so by hand. There's so many different things that can trigger a vertigo episode. It can be weather, it can be certain foods, even stress. And the current methods, such as medicine and physical therapy, they're not always effective and can have side effects. So that's just why there's such a significant need for a solution that can help vertigo sufferers track and manage their symptoms and also improve their quality of life. And that's why we've created Vertige, an interactive tracker for vertigo patients to manage their symptoms and start to be able to identify the trends in their triggers. In the app, users can track movement and mindfulness, sleep, stress, weather, medications, trigger foods, among other things. That data then populates into weekly reports that can be shared with their doctors, their physical therapists, even their family to help create a plan of care. 
So we offer a freemium option as well as a premium. In the premium, users have a 14-day free trial, and then after the 14 days, they're prompted to choose between a monthly subscription of $7.99 or an annual subscription of $59.99. So I'm so passionate about this because I've been there. I understand what my target market's going through and just what their pain points are. And in addition to my personal experience, my background's in marketing and in PR, and my co-founder has over 25 years experience in sales and operations. We've begun to build a great team and we have a solid tracker that's gonna be launching very soon. So we deployed beta in May of 2022 and now in the fall, we'll be launching our new updated tracker um, with a more user-friendly interface. We're gonna continue to focus on social media, such as like Instagram, Facebook, to continue to increase awareness and build trust with potential customers. On the other arm, we're doing outreach to doctors to help educate them and their staff on the app so that they can in turn refer to their patients. So we recently partnered with VEDA, the Vestibular Disorders Association, and are working with them, a doctor from MUSC, a doctor from Johns Hopkins, and a senior research scientist from NASA on a 100-person clinical trial. So we're super excited about this. The trial will be seeing how the weather affects vestibular patients. So our ask right now is for introductions to medical doctors, ENTs in the Mid-Atlantic region, who could potentially be on that trial with us. Thank you. started just writing everything down by hand. So, uh, you know, there's so many triggers, like I mentioned, so I was just habit tracking myself and started to identify these trends, which is how I, I came to find, like, this actually really helps, and th there could be potential out there to create the app. So, uh, with the partnership with Veda, the two first doctors are on their medical board, so they've been instrumental in helping me also come up with the additional features that we're putting in and launching. Um, so, uh, what was the second half of your question? Uh, so, clinical evidence to support like the use of the app. Like, I understand what you're mapping so that you can kind of help mm -hmm. people correlate their symptoms to maybe environmental or food or weather. Mm -hmm. um, but is there clinical evidence to support like the symptom and the things that you're tracking? And okay. um, and also, how do you plan to integrate that in the healthcare, like within healthcare? Because there's going to be more regulatory requirements needed. So, have you looked into that? And so I haven't looked into HIPAA compliance yet, and for the clinical, working with the doctors and beta, that's that's how we're starting, to use that data for clinical purposes, purposes um, research. They were just really excited when they first found out about the app because there hasn't been a whole lot of data and research done as of now, so that's going to be our first step into doing the clinical side. I think I have. Thank you for your... Hello? Okay. Wow, that was loud. Um, so I think mine is more feedback route because you kind of just walked through it with Sasha. Um, I think what I foresee is adoption and compliance might be something that you want to have a prog progressive strategy mm -hmm. towards just because we're reaching a stage in healthcare where it is hard to get someone to subscribe to another app to use another thing that they have to do. It adds to their own workload and unless it's something they feel like they're completely struggling with and it's debilitating, it's just another thing for them to wear. 
you're, we're hitting that wall of uh, people wanting to engage and comply to those kind of devices. So it's something that as you work with your, as you work with the Vita, I would have a progressive strategy of how to compensate for that, overcome that, especially if you want to be integrated into a medical system ultimately. Okay, thank you. The biggest problem for, for symptom tracking apps is patient engagement. Mm -hmm. The retention of patients is like the biggest problem in the diagnosis. So speaking for the clinical trial specifically, we're actually going to enroll 120 to 125 patients. Um, also on the app, we're going to have a notification pop up. Either we're deciding between if it's a daily notification or if the patient does not enter their information for one to two days, then something pops up, and then they can go back up to five days to enter their information. All right, so that brings us to the end of our Q&A. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nico, um, and as an undergraduate student living in the dorms, I would always get sick. The number one question, when is it going to go away? If you've experienced a common cold that just won't go away, the culprit is likely a sinus infection. 90% of individuals with the common cold will experience some element of sinus infection, which can prolong symptoms for weeks. While most of these go unnoticed, there are 30 million individuals diagnosed with sinus infections annually. Only 2% of these are bacterial, and yet sinus infections account for one in five antibiotic prescriptions in the US, or over 40 million prescriptions annually. Why does this occur? Well, first, bacterial and viral infections are symptomatically indistinguishable, which is problematic for a clinical diagnosis. Next, Physicians are under time pressure with only 15 minutes to educate and evaluate patients. Finally, patients expect antibiotics. Current guidelines recommend 10 days of watchful waiting, which leaves patients frustrated. Our solution is Backtest, a rapid diagnostic for acute bacterial sinus infections. Similar to a COVID test or a pregnancy test, back test would rapidly identify bacteria that comprise over 90% of infections and are appropriate for antibiotic use. We have identified target antigens that are present throughout all serotypes of our bacteria, and we believe they are ideal for diagnostic development. Most importantly, prior studies have shown it, uh, prior studies investigating um, strep throat have shown a 45% decrease in antibiotic prescriptions uh, among adults using rapid testing compared to empirical treatment. So unlike bacterial culture tests or CT scans, uh, back tests would be fast, affordable, and reassuring. A negative test would um, a negative test would encourage uh, patients or incentivize patients to seek alternate forms of symptom management, while a positive test would allow for immediate action and targeted antibiotic use, uh, which is a problem because the primary antibiotic physicians prescribe is azithromycin, which most bacteria are, um, which most bacteria are resistant to. Secondly, back test would be a non-invasive nasal swab uh, to ensure that patients are comfortable uh, and have a positive experience. Most importantly, this allows for self-testing applications. In order to differentiate ourselves, we are also investigating uh, methods to optimize sample control, reduce user error, and um, allow for multiplexed testing. And our goal would be to improve accuracy and usability of current rapid testing technologies. 
Now, $11 billion are spent in direct healthcare costs for sinus infections every year. And we estimate that $2.6 billion are spent on antibiotics. Each prescription costs an average of $60, and by reducing consumption, Backtest has the potential to significantly reduce healthcare costs. Initially, we plan to work with hospitals and uh, healthcare systems to target primary care uh, for use of our test kit in primary care settings. Um, after establishing ourselves with physicians, we would partner with pharmacies um, and their walk-in clinics and their walk-in urgent care clinics. Eventually, we plan to sell our test kit directly to consumers. We found that physicians are willing to endorse and guide patients to our test kits through online communications or virtual care. Um, and to quote, our test kit would change the disease management of sinus infections. We have a diverse team of undergraduate students at Penn, and we're looking to take advantage of all of the resources and support the community has to offer. We're currently working on expanding our network and are looking to connect. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Nice job, um, gentlemen. I automatically default to the ladies. Apologies. Um, so my first thing is the freedom to operate here. Uh, have you done a IP uh, prior art search to make sure that there's freedom to operate in, in what you're proposing? Because it does seem like this would have a competitive landscape. Yes. So um, there's currently no diagnostic specifically for sinus infections. Uh, that said, we do need to speak with a lawyer to thoroughly investigate uh, licensing and um, potential IP ability. If a diagnostic is developed, however, we would be able to IP it since with minor changes you can develop a diagnostic um, that would be IPable. That said, IP is not a primary competitive advantage in this industry, and rather it would boil down to, in my opinion, boil down to execution and uh, our ability to be first to market. Uh, where are you in the development of the test? Um, and you know, what is your timeline? Like, what does that kind of path development look like for you? Yeah, so full transparency were idea phase. Um, most of our data thus far was based on secondary research, and we recently realized the need to conduct additional primary research um, to identify and reduce risks. Um, in terms of development, we are um, in terms of development, we're working on a proposal and a prototype and have been gathering data from key opinion leaders and professors uh, to ensure we're uh, focused on meeting uh, adhering to all of the uh, guidelines. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so, of course, uh, well, what we did not show here today is that also there's an element of mechanical design in our uh, product proposal or like our prototype. Now, we do have a function or initial prototype of that mechanical design, and um, of course, unfortunately, for the biological work, some of it will be. Uh, well, it will require costs that we currently do not have yet at the moment, but we can also do um, create a model with a generic off-the-counter antibodies and that we can do fairly easily. Can your um, test be used for other uh, diseases or other types of diagnoses? Yeah, so lateral flow devices are um, commonly used. One of their advantages is that they're very mature technology, um, as well as 
low cost. So developing them would be uh, lower risk and lower R and D costs associated with that. Um, there's all kinds of lateral flow devices for all kinds of diseases currently on the market. However, none of those are positioned to address sinus infections. And our aim is to um, develop a test kit that focuses on the user experience and patient satisfaction um, in order to begin to change consumer mindset and allow for a decrease in antibiotic use. Um, and then to add to that, there's a large portion. Uh, we eventually envisioned the test kit being sold directly to consumers, and COVID has been a huge enabling factor in that. Um, so, yes. Okay. Well, thanks. That brings us to the end of our Q&A. Hello, everyone. Hi. Last but not least. <clears throat> Uh, hello, I am Alex. I'm the uh, one of the founders of uh, Medicratic, and uh, oh goodness, like where do we even begin? Medicratic was founded when <laughs> actually it was a casual conversation with a Penn residency program director. Uh, right, people apply to residency programs. This is how they become specialists. Right, it's how they become you know oncologists, radiologists, etc. Right, every doctor in the country has to do it. And Medicratic was founded when he mentioned like, almost offhand that the most stressful three weeks of this year was spent doing a single task, right? Reading 1,200 applications from applicants, 70,000 pages of text, right? A lot, right? But then we spoke to other program directors and we heard the same thing from every single one, right? They all suffered with the same problem. Right? And they felt guilt at just the concessions that practicality demanded. Right? And in fact, over half of applications received for residency in this country, right? applicants, the applications that those applicants pay to submit never get seen by human eyes. The core insight behind Medicratic right, is that relying on human eyes is the problem. Right? Ultimately, the solution to this, right, it is that dragging your eyes over every word on the page is not the right way to extract insights from applications, right? There is a better way to understand applicants, right? So, <clears throat> who's behind Medicratic? Right, the core team consists of Tana, Ryan, and myself. And I'm going to say some very nice things about them now. Uh, Tana actually came, uh, is a medical student, he's a third year MD MBA student uh, at UT Southwestern. And he actually came to, uh, he came to this uh, from econometrics. Uh, his background uh, in figuring out human economic preferences actually forms the foundation of how our platform, Halstead, uh, assesses reviewer preferences. <clears throat> Ryan has a background in cybersecurity, right? And as you may imagine, when you're dealing with incredibly sensitive data, Right? That is what they, his background lets us keep those applicants' information safe. Right? So what is it that we do? Right? Halston is an analytics platform. Right? Program directors upload their applications and it processes them and it allows them to understand their complete applicant pool in seconds. Right? They can transparently apply their preferences and they can mitigate biases. Right? How does my background play into this? Um, before medical school, I used to be an epidemiologist. Uh, and I used to have to, to define what that meant. But, uh, and then COVID happened, and now I have to less often. Um, <clears throat> right? Like magic, our tools would take in millions of data points and from them extract human knowledge. Right? I was enchanted. Right? In fact, I suppose I still am. The, uh, <clears throat> right? So, we see potential for this beyond just medicine, right? We see the technology underlying Halstead as the solution to the general problem of admissions, right? HR departments, college admissions offices, right? They deal with exactly the same problem, right? They are overloaded with applications and they cannot consider them all fairly, you know, amidst a you know, shifting background of 
public opinion, legislation, dare I say it, judicial rulings. <clears throat> and so, right, that's our, that's our vision for our platform. Right? Our ask today is, right, we have had incredible traction, right? We have uh, dozens of users, right, deployed across eight universities. In fact, there are people in who in five years, right, who will become oncologists, right, who have applied weeks ago and are being selected using our software now, right, which I try not to think about too, like, too directly. Uh, right, we need help to take this even further. Right, and today we're asking for investment of a million dollars to support our scaling aspirations, to take on additional full-time staff, uh, and ultimately work to extend our platform uh, to other fields. Right, that's it. That's our company. But uh, if you forgive me, uh, this is the Penovation Accelerator after all. I'm going to finish with a quote from Benjamin Franklin, who once said that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Right? And an investment, an investment in Medicratic, it's just that. Right? It's an investment in knowledge and in the people who have dedicated their lives to acquiring it. Right? We see a future where applying to anything, right, be it college, residency, a job, right? It's not a, it's not a barrier, it's a bridge, right? And for the people who see those applications, right, it's not a burden, but a joy, right? Our vision here isn't just to make admissions easier, it's to democratize opportunity. And uh, with your help, we hope we can make that happen together. Thank you. Um, my first question is, could you, so I understand that you may not be able to show us a lot of the technology to the proprietary software or, you know, such things, but if you could walk us through how the technology works so that we have a better understanding, that would be lovely. Yeah, absolutely. So actually the user flow, I mean, you know, we've always been very clear, right, that the like, function of this platform is to save people time, and so we've actually worked to make it almost as quick and easy to use as possible. In fact, uh, Tana, do you want to... Now walk through the general process of users actually using it? Yeah, so the process involves kind of two parts. Uh, in the first step, the program directors upload their zip file applications and it gets processed into our back end where all of our technology magic occurs to understand everything in there. At the same time, the program director then answers uh, a number of questions that teach the software what exactly that program director is looking for in the applications. So it will learn and be able to quantify things like how much do they care about a person's teamwork or how much do they care about their surgical skill. By then quantifying each of these different metrics, it can read the applications and put it all into a final score for each applicant much faster than the program directors can do themselves. Uh, we, in fact, booked our first revenue yesterday. Congratulations. Yes, we have um, several dozen programs that are using it, that have used it. Um, our initial beta test looked purely at archival years applications, just because this is, they could both compare it to the application ranking that they have produced using their traditional you know, processes. Uh, and in fact, as of last week, uh, it's being used to, uh, you know, programs have you know, trusted enough now that they're willing to use it to inform the selection of their current applicants for this year. Can you speak to us about um, your competitors and what your competitive advantage is? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so the competition in this space is actually remarkably light, uh, but the um, kind of the, we, what we see is our kind of two primary sources of competitive risk are um, the American Association of Medical Colleges, the AEMC, they produce the application system, uh, uh, ERAS, which all residents apply through. Um, in a sense, the problem is so bad in part because their system is so bad, right? At some level, right, and you know, we've even seen some of their internal documents, right, they don't even really clearly conceptualize why the system is broken, which makes any solutions that they try to take, you know, in a sense, they're 
treatments are ineffective because they have they have not correctly diagnosed the issue. Um, there's another organization called Thalamus GME, which is mostly does interview scheduling software, who has, I suppose you could call it like the closest equivalent prototype to a, a, a service like ours. It is based fundamentally around a different philosophy of what application review looks like, right? It's essentially built around the concept of we will make flicking through and reading applications faster and more convenient, but we're not doing the reviewing for you. Um, so that our kind of key conception here is that actually when you're dealing with application data on this scale, computational techniques to extract generalized insights is the only way to really understand them, right? In the same way that we concluded the drug works by looking at aggregate statistics of you know, comparing it with the control group, we don't read through 2,000 patient charts in a row. Okay, sorry, I have a, I have a question there, so. Um, <laughs> my next question is, could you explain further on your, uh, how you will make money, and then clarify whether, you, since, you, since you intend to expand out of just medical applications in general, are you leveraging um, HR? Kind of software, or mostly the I think you said the competitor was AMC kind of software as the basis to building this new software. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as far as making money goes at the top, right now we are currently just marketing directly to residency and fellowship programs. Um, as far as looking beyond in the way that this company is going to grow in the future, uh, certainly there could be nice ways to integrate it into existing platforms if those uh, organizations are willing to work with us. Um, that being said, we've seen remarkable uptake by program directors based upon the quality of our product. They don't mind adding a new platform to be able to get the tools that we've created. Um, so we could kind of see it going either way. There's certainly value in our mind in integration, but we don't feel like we are constrained by a need to integrate for what we already did. Thank you all so much. Um, the judges will uh, collect their scores and exit this way to start deliberating. Um, while you all wait, while the judges are deliberating on uh, the outcome of today and, and the program, we have Sarah Beth Gleason here who is going to give you an update on Melina, which was our winner from last year's program. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming out and supporting all of our uh, founders here. It's been a really amazing set of presentations and I'm here to sort of give a pitch, but more just kind of overlay that with like the progress we've made since last year. So I'm sure a lot of you are not familiar with us, uh, but I'll give you a sense of what that, who we are uh, as we proceed, but that's kind of what I'm planning for, for this little moment of time. So lovely to have you all, lovely to meet you all, and um, here we go. So just to start us off, uh, I'd like to tell us, help you celebrate with us. Uh, recently we've met, made some milestones. Um, my CEO and co-founder just joined the 776 Foundation as a, a fellow, which gave us some grant funding. So I'm just kind of putting that out there for anyone here. It's like, that's a really great opportunity. It's for 18 to 23 year olds. So we're pretty young, um, but it's just good to let you all know about that. Also, we've uh, participated in Generator, which is the Sustainability Accelerator, which is also another, um, we, it takes equity um, and you get funding as well. So uh, we're excited about that. And then we've also participated in the Science Inc. Accelerator at the Innovation Space, which is in Delaware, which is more local, and it's just uh, mentorship opportunities. So this is for all of you guys out there, like since we participated in the Accelerator, which was a great opportunity, we've since done things like this. Um, so going back to just us as a company, um, why now? So it turns out that 66% of textiles today are made from plastic fibers. Uh, and about 700,000 of those plastic microfibers are released during an average, average load of laundry. So anytime you put any polyester, nylon, any synthetic like that into the laundry load, it releases little pieces of plastic and they go out of the environment. And they wind up being eaten by fish and in our tap water. So 94% of US tap water contains microplastics 
and 25% of commercial seafood products contain microplastics. So this has been our story from the beginning. It hasn't changed since last year. We're still fighting for this awareness. We're still trying to solve this problem. So what do we do at Bellina? We build best-in-class next-generation filtration devices to reduce microplastic pollution in the fashion supply chain. So initially it starts with consumers uh, in the laundry cycle, but ultimately we hope to move further up the fashion supply chain as clothing makes contact with water in every step of its production. So what does that look like as a solution? Um, it's a filter that you can just put right inside the washing machine drum and run a normal laundry cycle and it'll come out looking kind of like this. Um, and we're working towards 70% filtration efficiency, that it will work with any machine, and that it will cost around $35, uh, $20 for the outer shell, and then $15 for filter replacements. Um, and just to give you a sense of where we started and where we're going, we started more with a ball system. So we threw it in the machine, and it could just toss um, around the machine normally, but we realized that that wasn't going to generate a high enough efficiency. So we moved to attaching it to the inside of the machine, and currently we're working, we have an M, uh, initial prototype, but we're trying to make sure it's safe to use at the moment. So um, it's evolved from this ball to like this attachment. And to talk about existing alternatives, so our competitors. Uh, there's these external filters that you can attach to the outside of the machine at the drainage hose. But those have a lot of issues in terms of plumbing. I mean, you kind of have to do some DIY plumbing, you know, nail things into your wall, pull the machine out from the wall. There's a lot of just barriers to that. Um, so a lot of people aren't interested in doing that. Uh, there's also laundry bags where you have to put all your clothing in a bag to make sure that it filters, which is pretty inconvenient and can unbalance the machine. And laundry balls, which is something that we were kind of thinking about before, but the efficiency levels are just so low. So we're working on something that is pretty cheap, is very effective and it's convenient to use so that more people will adopt it. Uh, so in the beginning, this is kind of the slide we had. Young, green consumers, renters, and first-time homeowners. And that's still the case, but we've kind of more narrowed in on who our customer is. So it tends to be a woman between the ages of 25 and 45 who does a lot of laundry, maybe has a kid or is living alone. Um, and so, you know, just to give a sense of how, how we sort of started to talk to our customers. Um, but so far, we've built a, an MVP. We have 351,000 product demo views on BuzzFeed, so check us out. Um, and we have about oh, over 175 customers waitlisted. And we definitely didn't have that last year, so a lot of progress there. Um, and we've also had this sort of customer discovery call calls with retailers, so not just the customers, but talking to people like the retailers who actually produce clothing and what they're looking for. Um, we can just kind of give a sense like they want their consumers to be educated. So that's why our product might be something that's interesting to them in the long term. Um, again, they want the customers to be consumers to be ready. And they also, some of them have garment washing facilities where they might use something like this. And to give a better sense of that, we've signed our first letter of interest with Arc they do a lot of uh, garment testing in their facilities, so they run a lot of laundry. They run laundry 24-7, um, and they're, they're interested in using our product. And just to give a, a sense of maybe the market potential for this, there are some numbers. This is a little top-down. Um, we, we have slides for bottom-up pricing and top-down market sizing, um, but this is a slide that kind of shows the potential here. Um, what's even more interesting, I think, is sort of to the left there with the, the governmental regulations that are incoming. So there's going to be, um, in January 2029, all new washing machines sold in the state of California will require a filter. Uh, so we're, we're thinking about that as we build our product and how we can work with manufacturers. And uh, to give a sense of who we are, uh, my name is Sarah Beth, I'm the COO. Uh, my partner, Julianne, the COO is, CEO is currently in North Carolina. And our uh, third co-founder, Shoshana, who actually gave this presentation last year, is now pursuing her PhD in Haifa, Israel. So this is some, some company changes here. Um, and we've had opportunities. We were also a winner of the President's Sustainability Prize last year. 
which has been a great, great opportunity for us. Um, we've been recognized as the inno Philadelphia's innovation under 25 members, and we also won the Accelerator Best Overall last year. Um, and I mentioned some other celebrations at the beginning of the presentation. And here are some of our advisors. Um, we're actually looking for some more in water filtration, and I'll, I have that on the ask slide at the end, but I might as well say it again right now. Um, and just to give you a sense of, you know, ethically and worth what the impact we're wanting to make, um, we have pilot program outcomes planned, so we want to see a significant decrease in microplastic concentration levels. We want to engage with the community, so we want to see growth in the turnout at locally focused cleanups and events. And we're looking to have an increase in the number of customers that we can empower. So if 10% of U.S. households use Belina, that'll be the equivalent of keeping 60 million water bottles out of our waterways each year. So thank you for listening. Uh, our asks for like this presentation are just to engage with us. So if you want to look at our website, join our wait list to sign up for a product launch. Um, and then I mentioned any mentors in the water filtration or fashion sustainability industries that you know of that you'd like to connect us to, please do. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions while the judges are gone or if you want to just talk to me after, feel free. I'm here as a resource. Um, absolutely love to get emails, love to meet founders, love to meet Anyone interested? So, yeah. Yes. How do you dispose of the filter? Yeah, so currently our model is we just throw it in the trash. Um, that's, in our view, better, better to contain it rather than let it out into the environment. We've also uh, explored and we're going to continue to explore more <laughs> closed loop options. Um, but ultimately, we're concerned about, you know, if we make a product out of the microfibers, whether or not that's still going to be in the environment and leaking. So, um, yeah, there's different explorations of sometimes, like, using it in construction materials. Um, there's also the argument that if you use it, then other people aren't going to produce virgin plastics. Um, so, it's a little bit of a philosophical question. It's not currently a priority, but definitely on our mind. So, short answer, we're throwing it in the trash. <laughs> A round of applause for our cohort. <laughs> okay, so um, at the be very beginning of the event, I explained that there are two prizes, and each prize has a different uh, criteria to be awarded. Um, so I'm going to first announce the best pitch, which is based on the pitch scores today and their performance, and then I will announce the overall winner, which is based on a variety of components, including the pitch score today, attendance throughout the program, taking advantage of opportunities, their participation, overall uh, uh, overcoming any challenges, as well as moving the needle. And I recognize that we are with them for only six weeks, so that needle movement is finite. Very, very small, but we like to see improvements. Okay, uh, so the best pitch goes to Pocket Scribe. <laughs> and our overall winner for the 2023 Innovation Accelerator goes to Medicratic. <laughs> Thank you all again so much, and please continue to follow what we're doing here at Penetration Work.